How to Brew Series Episode 2. In this episode, we're going to cover everything you need, no matter what brewing equipment you have or the beer you plan to brew. Hey fellow hop killers, my name is Dylan with the Hop Killer Brewery, where we bring you the brews, reviews, and how-tos. We're covering all the tools and equipment that you need to brew, regardless of the equipment you end up with. Not only am I gonna tell you what you need, I'm also gonna tell you why you need it, and I'll make sure to link it down in the description below in case you actually need it. So, be easy to get. This isn't the sexiest thing when it comes to brewing related videos, but it's everything you need and why. If you get any value out of this video, make sure to give me a thumbs up. If you enjoy this series or other brewing related content, make sure to consider subscribing. And if you can't get enough of me here on YouTube, follow me on Instagram at hopkillerbrewery. Let's get into it. All these tools and pieces of equipment are in no particular order. Hydrometer, a tool used to measure the density of a liquid based on the concept of buoyancy. There's multiple types out there, but for now, I think what covers the entire brewing process mainly is what's called a triple scale hydrometer. It measures from 1.000 specific gravity to 1.150. This is gonna be used in multiple stages during the entire brewing process from grain to glass, primarily during the mash, during the pre and post boil, into the fermenter during fermentation and finally when fermentation is complete. So it's gonna be used a lot. You wanna make sure you get a decent quality one, which they're all pretty much the same. They're roughly about 10 to $20 and just treat it well. Keep it in the little plastic container it comes with. And a pro tip, you can always check the calibration on these. If you go out and buy distilled water, you get your hydrometer tube that hopefully the hydrometer comes with. You fill the hydrometer tube with the distilled water dip your hydrometer in it and it should read zero. That's how you know. And if it's not zero and it say it's high or low, just account for that on every single reading you take from here on out. They have different hydrometers with different scales depending on what range you're trying to read. But for now, a triple scale works. For the sake of this series and probably any content you ever see from me, I'll always be measuring things in specific gravity, also known as SG. A thermometer. This is something that's critically important and it doesn't necessarily need to be fancy, but it needs to be accurate just like everything else. It could be a dial or digital. It doesn't really matter. If you can calibrate this, that is what you're looking for. A properly calibrated thermometer could be the difference between a perfectly dialed in finishing gravity on your beer or something very, very dry, which makes you question your entire sanitizing process and potential infection, which it could be, or it could be something on the opposite end of the spectrum, a high finishing gravity, which leads you to un not understand why your beer didn't attenuate. Proper mash temperature readings are critical for having your beer guided towards the desired finishing gravity. I've done a video on this in the past. So I will make sure to link above me that covers how to maintain a perfect mash temperature. And I also go into details as to why perfect mash temperature is so critical. But make sure you get yourself a nice thermometer. You're gonna use it a lot from water to mash, to boil, to whirlpool, and even in fermentation. Another thing you're gonna need, no matter what kind of brewing equipment you have, is a way to sanitize all of your gear. Sanitizing your equipment is paramount after the boil is complete and your wort is chilled. Everything your wort comes into contact with after it's been chilled, that means from the hose that it transfers into the fermenter, the fermenter itself, and everything after that, even up until the point that you're drinking is key. How do you do this? I've been using Star Sand since day one. It's easy to use, it's relatively cheap, and it's safe. There's really not much to it. It foams up, it does a great job making contact with all the surface that it requires. A pro tip, if you get some of that sanitizer solution from when you mix it up for your fermenter or what have you, get a spray bottle specifically for sanitizer, brand new so that it hasn't been used with anything else in the past, and fill that spray bottle up with sanitizer. You can use that to mist connections or transfer hoses or just surfaces that you feel need sanitizing. It can also be used in your airlock or blow off tubes and a few other things in the brewery. Brewery cleaner. You can't sanitize equipment if it isn't clean to begin with. I've been using PVW, that is by Five Star, and also the sanitizer, it's by Five Star, and it works like a dream. It's a non-caustic, 
cleaner. I'm not sure what goes into the chemical properties of this cleaner, though it's easy to use. It's relatively safe, though I would advise maybe wearing some gloves because it tends to dry out your skin and I know it's not good for you to have on you all the time. Brewing is cleaning. If you stick around the hobby long enough, you will surely find out that is the case. I'll link up above a video that I use to basically walk you through every cleaning process that I have. In that video, I go through uh, fermenters, I go through counterflow chillers, brewing equipment, whatever. It is linked up here. Make sure to use any personal protective gear that is required by that manufacturer to keep yourself safe. Another cleaner to have in the arsenal of your gear is what's called Barkeeper's Friend. Now this is an abrasive cleaner that I use for maybe heavier gunked up things such as like a boil over on the side of the kettle or just some rings in your fermenter that just won't give even with the PBW. Now use this sparingly depending on the equipment too because it is an abrasive cleaner. Some manufacturers do not recommend you use this cleaner on things that are etched. For example, they might tend to fade over time. I personally have yet to see any of that problem, but it's just something I wanna give you a heads up on. Tubing. You're gonna need a lot of tubing, and normally in different sizes depending on your connections in the brew house. I mainly use two types of tubing. I use 100% silicone high temperature food grade. So that's mainly used all on the hot side, that being transferring water, mashing, boiling, what have you. And on the cold side, nine times out of 10, I'm using vinyl tubing. And that's just because it's clear, it's cheaper, it's food grade, and it's easy to use and easy to replace as needed. The only key thing here is one, how much you need as far as length goes and two, the size of the connections you will be using, you wanna make sure you get the appropriate size inside diameter tubing. Another very critical and needed piece of equipment is a proper scale. Now I'm gonna talk about two scales, particularly one that measures 28 grams to one gram very accurately or something around that scale and one that reads one to 50 pounds. Now why two? Well one, the smaller scale is gonna allow you to measure out things like hops, yeast nutrients, brewing powder, or other little minute things that can make a difference if you have a scale that's normally geared towards higher volumes. It won't be as sensitive for smaller things like that, which in my opinion is very critical that you are measuring things appropriately. The second scale is mainly gonna be your bread and butter scale that's gonna be doing a lot of your grain weighing and water weighing and every other little thing that you need in the brewery. Uh, a pro tip, if you want to use that nice accurate scale that can read multiple pounds, if you're curious as to how accurate your etching or volume markings are on your equipment, such as a fermenter, bucket, what have you, we know that a gallon weighs 8.33 pounds or I think it's 3.78 kilograms. Pretty sure, fact check me, comment down below. But you know one gallon weighs those amounts, you could measure out that volume in a bucket and compare that to the volume markings on your buckets or fermenters or mash tons or whatever you're trying to cross check to see how well those etchings line up to the appropriate volume markings. Another needed thing when it comes to brewing beer, particularly great beer, which I'm taking you through this entire series with the goal in mind of, is a fermentation chamber. A fermentation chamber is ideal and it's required. I'm crazy about yeast, fermentation, and everything that comes to do with the fermentation process. Dialing in the temperature required for that yeast and doing things temperature-wise during fermentation is so critical to producing great beer. Is it required for okay or good beer? Not necessarily, and it's all dependent on your living situation, the time of year, and whatnot. Having a fermentation chamber in conjunction with an Inkbird temperature controller or some easy plug and play use temperature controller is key. Those were all the things that you need when it comes to brewing, no matter the equipment that we're gonna walk through later on. Now we're gonna cover things that are more optional, though I feel they flirt with that line between optional and required, depending on the quality of life you wanna have when it comes to brewing, as well as your budget. Extra tools of the trade list starting now, Beersmith. At the time of making this video, you're looking at 25 bucks to $30. And this is a lifesaver when it comes to all grain and you want to design your own recipes, you can use this brewing software to cover everything. pH, water volumes, ingredients, 
uh, dialing in ranges of specific gravities that you're shooting for, IBUs, color, it covers so many things and it has a ton to reference from. I've been using it since I've started brewing and I know a lot of professional breweries use it as well. It's a one-time purchase, though you can buy the upgraded one as it comes out with. Brad, the dude who owns and operates this software company, does a killer job at doing so. I highly suggest you get some sort of brewing software if it's not Beersmith. I always recommend Beersmith as a brewing software for anybody interested in recipe design. A pH meter. pH is so critical when it comes to making beer. You use the pH meter from water to finished beer and everything in between. I mean, it. You use it a lot, so having a good pH meter that you can calibrate and depend on is key. I'll link up above a video I did reviewing the Milwaukee MW102 pH meter that I use, and I've used home brewing, and I know a lot of professional breweries use it as well. It's a tried and true pH meter, it's great quality, and it does its job dependably. Now this next one is something I believe every home brewer should have purely from a time and quality of life aspect. That's a kegging system. You need kegs, a CO2 tank, extra fittings and hoses, and a kegerator. Whether that be something DIY like a keezer like I use, or a mini fridge that you just slap the faucet on, or an old fridge that you drill the hole through the door and have a faucet going through there, a kegerator is king in my opinion. I hate bottling beer. And what I hate even more is waiting to have that beer that I just bottled for it to carbonate in the bottle. Not only do I hate bottling beer, I'm not that good at it to be honest, so maybe that's where my bias lies, but it saves you so much time. I mean, you fill one keg rather than 55 bottles per batch. That's a big time savings. Anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes a keg of beer, and it takes me, at least, hours to bottle a batch of beer and there's a lot more involvement, it's messier, there's just, I just don't like dealing with it. And what's so cool about the kegging is once you have your beer in the keg, you can burst carbonate it and have it be ready in a day or less. I mean, you can even have it be ready in 30 minutes if you wanna sit there and shake it and it's already cold. I mean, who wouldn't want their beer sooner? And something you can even dial in the carbonation level. Once you bottle your beer and it's either undercarbonated, perfect, or overcarbonated, you're pretty much screwed. When you have overcarbonated beer in a keg, you can adjust that. If you have undercarbonated beer in a keg, you can adjust that as well. An RO unit. This is something that truly is optional, depending on how much you brew, how far away you are from getting RO water at the store, how much time you wanna spend getting it, and a bunch of other luxuries. So owning a RO unit, I think is a luxury. Now, why is an RO unit optional? Well, for me, I feel like to make great beer, it's not because of the water I have to use currently. It's just absolute trash. I would never wanna brew beer with it. It's packed full of chlorine, chloramines. It's very hard, has a lot of minerals. So I'd be pretty limited to the brew styles that it would work well with, even when I removed all the chlorines and chloramines. Now, RO water is a blank slate that you can easily add minerals to adjust depending on the brew that you plan to brew. Beersmith, like I said before, has a very easy to follow water adjustment. There's also Brewer's Friend, Brew and Water. There's a ton of brewing adjustment softwares out there you can use. And I'm gonna break into adjusting your water at a future video later on in the series. I personally use an RO system from an aquarium supplier that's called Bulk Reef Supply. They have a ton of products, but they also have their own line of RO and RODI units that I used to use for a saltwater aquarium before I even got into brewing. Yeast starter equipment. Again, this is not required depending on how and when you get your yeast, but I'm telling you, you're gonna wanna invest in some yeast starting equipment. What does that look like? You're looking at an Erlenmeyer flask, a stir plate, a stir bar, and some dry malt extract you can buy in a bag. The yeast starter is something that would actually pay for itself depending on the batch sizes you brew or how much you brew. You can usually get away with buying one packet of yeast instead of two or three depending on how much you need for your batch. And DME or dry malt extract is super cheap, so you can basically not spend an extra 15 to 20 dollars by not buying those two extra packets and make a starter and you can do this a few times and you can pay for the equipment 
over probably the course of a year, depending on how frequently you brew. Not only is it gonna pay for itself, you're gonna have prime yeast ready to go to work at a vigorous and healthy rate rather than being sluggish and potentially creating off flavors from poor fermentation if you didn't make a yeast starter to begin with. All of the items I've talked about will be linked down in the description below. This pretty much concludes this episode. If I missed anything, again, make sure to comment down below so one, I can be notified, and two, others watching can also learn what was left out and what you feel and why it wasn't in this video, probably because I forgot, but it's always helpful to have another opinion when it comes to things that are required when it comes to brewing. We're gonna be diving deep on an equipment selection and equipment setup episode later in the series. But for now, it's something to have in the back of your mind if you haven't purchased equipment as to what style of equipment you're gonna want, but everything in this video is something you're gonna need no matter what. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you guys on the next episode. Cheers.